there, there's a lot of respect, mutual respect in the partnership. So that is good. Um, we also give each other a lot of space. So that is also good. You know, we're not breathing down each other's necks. We're both very different people and we mm -hmm. respect that difference. Um, also the fact that we're very different, I think benefited our partnership tremendously over the years. So I can only really say only really positive, great things. That's why, you know, we thievery corporation has been around for 25 years is because yeah. the partnership was so good and healthy and, you know, What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh -huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Re Re Rebel Radio. What's up, Rebels? Welcome back to Rebel Radio, the weekly show where I bring you the rebels who are shaping our culture. I'm your host, Josh Levine. This week, I'm sitting with Eric Hilton. He is uh, one half of Thievery Corporation, and he's dropping his new solo album, Ceremony, later this month. If you like Thievery's music, you're going to love this one. It's, uh, it's more great music out of this guy. And uh, in our conversation, he gives us really a master class in creative vision and how to stay focused on, on what he's making and not get distracted by you know everything that's happening in the outside world. We talk about influences, both what to let in, what to keep out. Um, we get into uh, some great lessons on partnership. Um, he and his, his partner, Rob, uh, you know, have been hugely successful as, as a group and now um, are working on, you know, things on their own. And we talk about a lot of those lessons and uh, so, so many great lessons and just a great conversation. I'm going to just jump into it right now. Right on, man. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. I appreciate you making time. I've been, uh, you know, I don't know how much of my background you got from Lawrence, but, you know, I was with Herb Magazine for many, many years. I know. I um, remember. Yeah. I've been following you guys, you know, pretty much from the beginning and, and you know, always loved your music. And uh, and now I've been listening to the, the new stuff, the solo stuff, and it's, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, better late than never. I'm, I'm really enjoying myself, you know? Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm excited to hear about that. I think um, the, uh, you know, the ability to sustain a career in, in what you do, right. You know, based on your, your creativity and the, the output that it takes is um, it's a rare gift and achievement and, and uh, I'm sure not easy. So I'm yeah. excited to talk about some of that. Cool. Um, well, right on. Well, yeah, if you don't mind, I, uh, indulge me a little bit. Take me back to the beginning. Um, do you remember the first record you ever bought for yourself? Yeah, I do. Um, it was in Potomac Village, Maryland, where strangely, I just moved back to. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, which is interesting. Uh, just temporarily, but uh, it's, that's another story. Um, but it was uh, Axe Victim by Bebop Deluxe. Oh wow! Don't know why I bought the record? The cover looked cool, <laughs> and okay. it was two ninety nine, and I bought it, and I really liked it. And sure. uh, there, there are a couple good tracks on that record. It's very prog rock, yeah. um, kind of art prog rock. Um, yeah. All I had prior to that were like my mom's Beach Boys records and things like that. So I was probably mm -hmm. like seven, you know. Really, I mean, it's <laughs> funny. It's funny how you know, I think especially for our generation, just the role that artwork played, right? And, uh, you know, especially you going into stores and, you know, most of the stores didn't have listening stations or anything like that at the time. That was kind of later. So, yeah. you know, you sort of had, you either knew the record you were going in for or you had to really rely on the artwork. Um, yeah, but the artwork think, told me on that one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, well, funny. And so, and then how'd you get started making music? You know, I, I guess it came out of DJing. Uh, I was dabbling in DJing. Um, I got a, my big break. I was uh, sitting around uh, my home wondering what to do. And I was dreaming of being a DJ and I had never DJed before um, in a club. And then five minutes later, this uh, British guy who I barely knew called me and said, Hey, try out to be a DJ at this big club downtown. 
I thought that is the weirdest thing in the world, you know, <laughs> like he knew, he knew my taste in music, so he, he yeah. liked it, but I had never talked to him about DJing. So I felt like that was the universe talking to me in some way. And Oh, that's crazy. Went, did the, did the tryout, which was hilarious for the owner of the club, played like three records, like, okay, you're hired. <laughs> and uh, so then I got that gig and I was all of a sudden a full-time DJ um, at, 21 years old or 20 wow. years old, I don't remember. And, uh, you know, after a while, you just, you, you start feeling like you can make the music that you're playing. Sure. And, uh, you well, know, a lot of it was house music or, or early hip hop. And, you know, it's not complicated to make that music. So if you get mm -hmm. the right gear and, uh, and try hard enough, you can do it. So what was that first gig? Do you, do you remember what you played and what, what the <laughs> reaction was and like the feeling of that night? Yeah, I, I mean, I remember playing, I remember being very, very nervous um, and I wasn't much of a beat matcher. So I was, I was really practicing all the time um, and I was getting better, but it was, it was a downstairs gig. So it was more of like the, the hangout, there was a dance floor, but it wasn't the main room. Right. And uh, so that took the pressure off a little bit, but uh, a couple of weeks later, the guy got sick on the weekend and I had to play the main room and then I was uh -huh. really sweating, man. But, uh, you know, that, that, that hooked me. I mean, you know, I was playing the main room and you know, yeah, I kind of never looked back from there. Yeah. Uh, that's so cool. What a, what a great, uh, what a great story that, that just kind of fell on you. Yeah. It was, it um, was, it was fun. Yeah. So, uh, so then you, you start making music. What, you know, I'm interested, um, in the kind of like early influences and how, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have an assumption that, you know, when, when you start out, those influences are so kind of heavy on, have, have such a big impact. And then yeah, over yeah. time that relationship changes. Right. Um, so the, yeah. Wh what were some of those yeah, influences um, and, and, and how has that changed, you know, y years later now? Um, well, when I started DJing, uh, you know, it was, it was dance music, basically. Um, so it wasn't actually my, the music I was completely passionate about. And mm -hmm. I had, you know, like many people I have a very, you know, wide uh, spread taste in music. And right about that time, I guess it was like in the, I don't even remember when, but shortly after this whole acid jazz thing came out, you know, the, yeah. the, the scene and the, the scene in England was more interesting to me. You know, the, some of the American releases were a little silly, but um, you know, that was a tongue in cheek uh, genre uh, moniker by Giles Peterson, as you probably know, like they yeah. asked him, what, what kind of music are you playing? And he just made it up and he said acid jazz, but he was, yeah. there is no such thing really. It was just anything that his taste um spoke mm -hmm. to and so i kind of got into that scene because it was broad based and i'm like oh i like some of these bands you know i like uh the talking loud records and mo wax which was mm -hmm. early trip hop and um a lot of stuff so united future organization i really liked um so that kind of opened my mind to expanding into other you know, styles of music um I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, I was into so many different things. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I guess where I was going with that is that, that, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're sort of like, there's the influences we know about, and then there's the ones that maybe sort of creep in. Um, mm -hmm. and so I wonder, you know, as you've gone on and, and, you know, really learned your style and your taste, how, how conscious are you? of what might be influencing you. You know, I talked to some people who are like, when I'm making music, I don't listen to other stuff because I don't want it in there. I'm the um, same way. I, I, right? I listen these days to very little music from other people because I don't want to focus on their music. You know, I sure. want to focus on the, the stuff. I feel, feel like in my lifetime, I've listened to so much music and tape recorded in my brain. Um, but um, I am always walking around with like Shazam and stuff. Like if I hear a track that I actually like, I need to know what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it also could be, look, I'm not going to lie. We all steal, right? So it could be a chord progression in a song mm -hmm. that I like. I heard a song the other day. I can't tell you who it was, but 
it was a soul song, but it had a great chord progression. I'm like, you know, that, that's a cool chord progression. I'd like to do something along those lines. Never exactly yeah. the same, but sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're all influenced by so many things. No one's doing totally original stuff. You know, it's yeah. it's just a combination of things that came before. You know. Yeah. So so, kind of, in that beginning stage, when when did you guys realize with the Corporation that that you had something like you, you talked about, kind of big break? Like, when was that? You know, was there a moment where you looked at each other like, yeah, this is it. We're yeah. we're we're doing this. For me, um, I think it was when our we released our album, which was about a year after we started releasing singles. Then we released an album, which I guess we printed vinyl and CD and we did 5,000 copies of the CD and we borrowed money from a friend and, and paid him a lot of VIG <laughs> for the money. And, uh, and they sold really quickly and we blew through like 5,000 CDs and then we had some money to press some more and, and yeah. then those sold and we're like, wow, people really want to consume our music and they want to have it. And yeah. I think that was the moment where, it wasn't that we were making so much cash from it or even that wasn't the point, but we realized it was sustainable. Yeah. And um, I think at very sh so shortly after Rob quit his day job, which was with his dad's company, which he didn't want to work there anyway. And <laughs> we started, we were full-time, you know, musician producers at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting, right? Because you you start kind of like with this idea in your head, and and you know, I I'm not a musician, but I imagine there's a lot of insecurity in that relationship, right? Like you you want to make stuff, you you know, you want people to love it. You don't know necessarily how how it, how it's going to connect with people, and then I think when it does, you know, I wonder. So is that um, you know, does that fill you with confidence? To, to go out and, and keep going? Does it add pressure? You know, um, well, me, it, or is it, it all it, of the above? It, all of the above, because it initially fills you with confidence and um, sometimes overconfidence. So you have to check mm -hmm. yourself on that. Um, but then you have to do it again, you know? So like when we released uh, Mirror Conspiracy, we I remember we were talking together alone in the studio and we both were saying, you know, this record is pretty feminine in a way and and it, it's a bit of a departure from the first record i hope people like it you know but that was it i mean there's nothing we could do we were going to yeah. release the record but we didn't yeah. we weren't even sure if people would like it and then when they liked that one you know we felt like okay you know we have some sort of sensibility that you know sure that connects with people you know but. yeah so i read a quote you said that i'm a i'm a big believer in, in artists only making music only making art for themselves mm. Um, yes. and, and it's kind of kind of what you're talking about right and i think it's great that's a great sentiment after it's done to go oh i hope people like it so but t teach me how to do that <laughs> right how do you how do you how do you keep the world out and the expectations out and especially now when you know you have direct access to fans they have direct access to you as right. much as you each allow each other in, right? And and I think you know for uh, for an artist's career that that's that part is becoming more and more important, right? As yeah. you know, fan engagement, for lack of a better word, right? Um, so so how do you do that? How do you maintain the the borders around your creativity when you need to? Well, I mean, I I feel like that's an excellent question, and it's a hard one to answer. But it is, you know, something that I personally, you know, deal with, you know, today, every day. Um, for myself, I feel like there are many things we have to do in life, and some of them I'm better than than others. For some reason, when it comes to artistic um, endeavors, I'm very, very, very confident. Like I just believe in what I believe in. And that helps me in that way. It hasn't hurt me that I know of. Um, not everybody feels that way. And then I think those people need somebody in their life to to kind of be a sounding board and 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 really like kind of give them a pep talk, you know, um, yeah. encourage them. 
Um, everybody needs encouragement, right? And and I get sure. that sometimes from like my engineer that I'm working with, or mm -hmm. or or of course Rob, you know, if we're working together in the studio. Um, but even that, like you know, we don't really pep talk each other. Like we just, if we don't like it, if one of us doesn't like it when we're working together, that's it. You just move on. Um, yeah. So working alone is much harder because it's all on you, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. You just have to have like a bit of an inner like motherfucker about you, you know, where you're like, nice. all right, you know, <laughs> screw you all. I like this, you know, and I'm yeah. doing this because I like it. And I, you have to remind yourself of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I feel like as a listener and I, and I, you know, I'm sure this is not true, but I feel like you can tell when the artist isn't worried about your approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think and, so. and like I said, I'm sure there's a lot of inc a lot of exceptions to that, like uh, it, you know, one way or the other. But but it, but it feels like it comes through that there's an attitude that comes through. Well, this concept of approval is very interesting because, like today in our world, it does seem like people seek approval more than ever. So that would affect you know music making and and, sure. and all of that. And then you think about records like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and some really out there records where you, you realize they were not seeking someone's approval. They were really going, you know, deep into yeah. some tangent that they, yeah. you know, that, that, that really spoke to them. And I think that's where the most interesting music is probably comes from is when people just, you know, just listen to themselves or their tight knit group of people that they're working with. Mm -hmm. um, like, no offense to pop music, because uh, I like a lot of pop music from the past mostly, but mm -hmm. but it's not interesting to me because like there's been so many amazing pop songs written, done, right. you know that that style of music. It, it's hard to contribute to it. You know, I actually think about like, well, where can I contribute to music in general? You know, yeah. and um, it's probably more in like an experimental way. You know. It's interesting. I um, I find like yeah. I I catch I you know I think I don't like pop music, and then I catch myself usually with pop music from the seventies and eighties, loving you know their songs that I love, and and sometimes I wonder, you know, is it me or is it them or you know it's a, yeah. <laughs> like you know we always think that we always think that our music whatever that it is is better. Yes. Um, but I think a lot of it's us, right? It's, you know, we were at a certain time in our lives when we discovered that stuff and it just, you know, it's carry, carries more meaning. It's totally true. Yeah. <laughs> as um, much as we don't want to admit it and say that the music from, you know, our generation, you know, when we were right. teenagers or whatever, so much better. You know? <laughs> of course. Um, but so you, you mentioned, you know, your partnership with Rob and I, I want to talk about that a little bit and kind of where where that's gone but um but obviously you know uh you guys were hugely successful and and you know had a long lasting partnership that i assume i assume has served you both really well in in certain ways Absolutely. um so thinking back to that and maybe the beginning of that or 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 along the way what are the things you know if what are the things that you guys did right as partners uh, that really made that work? And, and you know, what are some things maybe that you would tell me if I were starting a partnership, you know, to, to do differently or to watch out for? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, well, I think on the doing right side, uh, there, there's a lot of respect, mutual respect in the partnership. So that is good. Um, we also give each other a lot of space so that is also good. You know, we're not breathing down each other's necks. We're both very different people and we mm -hmm. respect that difference. Um, also, the fact that we're very different, I think benefited our partnership tremendously over the years. Um, you know, I kind of am like a workaholic, like studio rat and I do other things too. Like, on, you know, so I have two full-time jobs and. Rob's more laid back and kind of like goes with the experience more and sort of likes to hang out and he likes mm -hmm. to travel a lot more than I do, although I do enjoy travel, but um, so we're very different in that way. Um, 
And then, yeah, I think those are like the main positives. Um, mm -hmm. The neg there really are no negatives with our partnership other than it's just really hard to keep a partnership together for, you know, multiple decades, right? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're probably at that point now where, you know, he's doing solo stuff, I'm doing solo stuff. I really don't know if there will ever be another thievery record because like logistically, mm -hmm. I just don't see it happening. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so we might be talking about a partnership that exists mostly in the past, um, mm -hmm. although we haven't announced any breakups or anything. And, you know, Fair we're enough. not really into that kind of drama. Um, yeah. So I can only really say only really positive, great things. That's why, you know, we Thievery Corporation has been around for 25 years is because yeah. the partnership was so good and healthy and, you know. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, that, that in itself is an achievement. Um, uh, uh, was there a moment when you realized or you both realized, you know, it was time to go do solo projects? Um, no, well, yeah, different times. So uh, Rob did something in the mid 2000s. He did a rock project called Dust Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And he poured a lot of creativity and time into that. And so that was a, you know, definitely a solo effort. Um, for me, I had, I always felt like I was so lucky to be part of one successful musical project that all of the sketches that I had, I just sort of piled them up for Thievery Corporation. And yeah. plus the music I make is just very, it's Thievery Corporation, you know, that's just kind of stuff I make. So, um, you know, I didn't feel like I wanted to do the solo stuff. Then a couple years ago, I really felt like it was time to wind Thievery Corporation down. But Rob and I, you know, we kind of disagree about that in a healthy way. So, mm -hmm. I, but he was making his own stuff. So I said, listen, man, you should go do your solo stuff now because this is a good time. And you should, yeah. you should pour yourself into that. I was not actually thinking of doing solo stuff. Um, I, I dabble with a reggae project with my friend and I did this other Echo Dome project with another friend just for fun. And then I started working at home alone um, a couple years ago and I just got hooked. I just started composing music on my own. I'm like, this is fantastic. I love it. And I, nice. I think that's all I'll ever do from now on. Like, it's mm -hmm. really weird how that bug hit me so late, but you know, that's what I'm doing. Sure, sure. Um, so, so, how's it different writing on your own? It, you know, it's I don't know. It's a very meditative process for me. It's a very it's like probably the most peaceful thing that I get to do, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't get to do it as often as I'd like. But maybe that's good because you know then I I, I get a little bit of build up and and um, you know I want to do it when I get the time. Sure. Um, yeah. but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's like being a painter, you know, I think like when you're a, an artist, a, most of the time when you're an artist, you want to work alone. Mm. You know? I mean, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to paint with somebody else. Right. With music, yeah. it's di a little bit different, but yeah, these days, I, I don't know. I can play keys well enough to, you know, play keys for myself and I can play guitar sure. and bass and, you know, do all those things. So, I mean, I'm not the best, but if it sucks, I'll get my guitar player friends to come in and overdub, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think there's still this kind of like, you know, the lineage of a rock band or, a, or an R and B act, right. That's like, you know, you play the guitar, I play the drums, you know, yeah. we each, we each do our thing and, and it all fits together as opposed to, you know, synthesized programmed music where, um, there is no reason that one person can't do it as well or better than, than a collaboration. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny, like it, uh, if thievery were, if thievery were a band, we would have broken up a long time ago. You know, <laughs> bands are just so hard to sure. keep together. Now we yeah. are a band when we play live, which is one of the right. incredible things of thievery corporation is that somehow through myself and Rob, not being able to do our music live, we just, through players on stage with us and then it kind of worked you yeah. know so we've created this live performance 
and and that's great. But if all those people were actually making the decisions we make, there would be no mm -hmm. corporation. We'd be done. <laughs> And they're sure. great people, but there's just too many opinions, you know. I mean, that is, uh, you know, my my friends and bands, who, you know, I, I don't know how they make it work, you know, year after year. I mean, you um, must know people in pretty successful bands. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. And and I'm I'm always blown away that that you know, the, uh, you know, first of all, that they're just able to to maintain the relationships that they have, yeah. and secondly. Um, that they can do it, you know, successfully, you know, on a, on a commercial scale in front of millions of people. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is. It is incredible. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Um, so many bands end up like where all the members hate each other and each person has their own tour bus. <laughs> and, like, totally. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. It <laughs> is. It's, 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 I've, I've developed a lot of empathy for that. Right. Like I get how hard yeah. it is. Yeah. And I get, you know, I'm in a in a I think 18 year now marriage and and that's incredibly hard and great and it's you know yeah any but any, being any a band is kind of like being married before. sure Absolutely. except for you have millions yeah. of people watching every step and you know yeah and gossip right. and rumors and and all that stuff right um, yeah so yeah that that's crazy so you mentioned you have two full time jobs is that are we is that the club the I do hospitality venues yeah. uh, with primarily my brother and some other partners. Um, yeah. So yeah, at, from 18th Street Lounge, I mean, I, with that partnership, I, I'm sort of on the design concept build side and then mm -hmm. luckily then I can peace out. Um, but uh, yeah, I've probably designed and built like 20 restaurants and bars, you know, oh, wow. all, in, all in DC, the DC area. Amazing. And I'm, yeah. I'm still like thick in that game, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, for the the studio was at 18th Street Lounge. That was like my mm -hmm. first club, and yeah. um, it was there so for how, a couple of years. So how does the what are you what are the lessons from the hospitality business that you brought to your music or to your your career as a musician? Not not really that many actually. They're pretty okay. they're pretty different. I mean, you know, I just. I got into both making music and the hospitality business by being a DJ. So mm -hmm. I guess with enough healthy arrogance, I felt like, oh, I could make that music. And then on the other side, I said, well, I could open a club, you know, instead yeah. of DJing at someone else's club. So, you know, that's kind of, those are the two paths that I went down and they, they were really um, complimentary in the 18th street lounge days because of, you know, I was DJing three nights a week at that club. I could test sure. the recorporation music on the sound system, which is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And I could also work in a session with Rob. And then right after the session's over, I could, you know, hang out at the club and make sure everything's okay. So, you yeah. know, <laughs> there's no sure. waste of time, you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it, I don't know. It, maybe I'm, you know, in my mind, I think to some extent we're all in the hospitality business. Yeah. Right. In that, in that if, if you have clients or customers or fans or whatever, you are in part responsible for creating experience for them. Right. That's or or to some extent your success is defined by those experiences. Um, and so I, you know, I don't know. I, I think if I had to guess, I think that serves you whether it's directly related or not. Um, I think that's a great point. Yeah. And also respecting the people that are, you know, your customer, whether, you know, sure. it's for a podcast or a magazine or a restaurant, you know, yeah. I mean, those people are entrusting their time with you. So you better give them something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you talked about moving uh, out of the city. How, how does that, um, has that impacted your creative process at all? I mean, it definitely has. I mean, I'm very much a city person, um, but yeah, you know, my wife and I obviously were riding out the pandemic, you know, in a very um, urban part of DC, um, mm -hmm. very um, congested part. And it just got depressing, you know? I mean, all the bars and clubs were closed and just, it, it, 
I was, so then we started looking for an escape hatch and we were looking in these mountain areas in Virginia about an hour and a half away and we couldn't really find the right place. And then this, this place that we were very aware of just became for rent and we, we were like, okay. And it was this bizarre cabin in my old hometown of Potomac where I kind of grew up on the river, not expensive. And it was, uh, you know, just a beautiful spot with a river view and, uh, we went to look cool. at it and just took it right away and uh it's kind of the coolest place i've ever lived I and mean, just really wow. enjoyed it. yeah yeah but um, it is in the suburbs technically it's like exurbs you know almost country sure. but um so yeah, it is weird living that, out there. so do you find that does the environment kind of impact your mindset when you're when you're writing making music yeah it's just more peaceful you know it's just looking at um I do have this one trick. I even did it at eight, uh, 18th Street Lounge. We would, I would just look out the window and like if you if you could see like the sky is is really beautiful that day or whatever, and you see a beautiful sky. If your song is not complementing that picture, you're you're off base. You know, mm. like your music has to level up to whatever beautiful scenery you have. So mm -hmm. obviously, more mm -hmm. challenging, the more beautiful scenery. <laughs> And I, I do that with, uh, right now I'm kind of making an ambient record, sort of almost like Brian Eno. Genre. Oh, wow. Yeah, just just nice. for fun. And I'm I'm definitely looking out at the river and the nature a lot. And if if they go hand in hand, then I know I'm on the right track. You know? Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, tell me about what's, I, I, I know there's, there's a new album dropping. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it seems like you have, you have multiple projects this year coming out um so tell me a little bit about the plan what what's coming and and how you're how you're envisioning all that unfolding um well short term you know uh, the third album uh ceremony comes out on august 20th which you know mm -hmm. um and then you know i have like competing projects musically that i'm working on like i'll jump around like doing stuff that sounds very like Saldaje, the Thievery record, you know, sound mm -hmm. like it belongs on that. Or I'll do very heavy electronic music one day or or even for 30 minutes and then I'll switch gears. And so I kind of put sketches in different categories and then whatever seems to be progressing the fastest, I'll usually finish that first. Mm. So strangely, this ambient record has been very inspiring for me the last few weeks and I feel like it's almost finished. And nice. you know, obviously that's like four or five songs, right? Because each song sure. is very long. And um, right. but uh, so that'll probably be you know in the fall. And then uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff that is a little bit more like future soul uh, trip hop meets like LTJ Bookum kind of stuff that mm -hmm. is a little bit more slick but soulful. Um, I have quite a bit of that, so that will become a project at some point. But and is the feeling that fans can handle sort of, you know, different sounds and styles or is, or is it to not care about that? And, and I don't care anymore, but one thing I've always um, thanked the Thievery fans for, and I've always been amazed at how much leeway they did allow Thievery, you know, genre wise and still remain fans, right? Because Yes. You know, when you're doing kind of a heavy dub type track and then you're doing these like bossa, easy listening tracks, a lot of people would think that's a complete disconnect and, you know, right. it throws them off. Right. But it didn't seem to throw people off. You know, I think people understood like we weren't in a tight box. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I think, first of all, our, you know, age groups, attachment to genre is very different than young people mm -hmm. um you know i have a my son's about to be 12 and like he doesn't i mean he thinks he likes house music but he he doesn't care what kind of music <laughs> you know what, yeah. what the label is on it right um and i think that's very different for us right we grew up in right in a culture that was very much des defined by genre um sure yeah definitely. But, but i also think you know to your point, like thievery fans, you know, are, you know, 
outside of the mainstream that was that was so much defined by like radio formats right and yeah. um and we you know we're we're club culture where you know you may be jumping genres or jumping you know time periods or right that that's the beauty of dj culture is that it's it's mixing and you know blending things that you maybe didn't expect to go together yeah absolutely um, so yeah that that doesn't surprise me I, I, that that fans would allow it i think it's it's um i think you know people are probably down for the journey yeah and and to your earlier point when you know when it's delivered with confidence and conviction and, and meaning right that you know that that all becomes easier to swallow yeah yeah i totally agree um so is tell me about montserrat house Oh, Montserrat House. Well, it, it, there's a physical place called Montserrat House. Um, it's, it's just this crazy art loft that um, is surrounded by a bunch of like little hospitality places that we did, um, like bars and some restaurants. And it's right across from 930 Club. So it has a great mm -hmm. um, location. And it was, I, I don't know, I just, I, I was obsessed with that place. Um, it was an old, the original Montserrat house was an old head shop um, owned by these guys from Montserrat, the island that had the volcanic mm -hmm. eruption. And um, they would sell weed out of there and they had a little reggae uh, compound going on where they would have live concerts in the backyard and all kinds of stuff. And so in my youth, I would always see it. I really never went there. I know people who bought weed there. It closed up for many years. And then through some strange turn of events, I ended up leasing it from uh, this very nice woman. And, you know, we, we just always called it Montserrat House because that's, that's what we knew it as. And um, mm -hmm. it, it, at one point it became Thievery Studio for Temple of I and I and Treasures from the Temple. Um, those records were made at Montserrat House and um, it, it just has mad vibes like the place is cool and we've had uh, Moby is um, perform there acoustically and we've a lot of people have come through there and done fun things and but you know right now during the shutdown it's just filled with restaurant furniture and it's a story <laughs> of course. It's so hard to look at it you know but course, you yeah. know we started a, a, a label. I say we, you know, it was, uh, I guess it's really me, but um, I, I just in tribute, you know, the label is called Montserrat House. Um, yeah. That was sort of the last thievery studio, you know. Nice. It's not even a studio right now. You know? Sure. Um, well, look, I, I mean, I think, you know, as much as things are, are opening up, it seems like, uh, you know, people are excited to have the opportunity to reconnect in person and to be, you know, to be in the place to be wherever that is. Um, so hopefully that's going to come back and be a great thing. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting, the, the dynamic between the label and the physical space. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that evolves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. We can't do this forever. <laughs> no, know? I mean, I don't know. In LA, I mean, I, I saw the news recently, but I feel like people just can't, it can't continue. I mean, yeah. no, I mean, we're, look, we're fully open uh, with masks, you yeah. know, you know, but you know, we went to, we went to an insomniac show two weeks ago. We went to a festival saw some house music with five or 10,000 other people. And, and awesome. it was amazing. And it was, yeah. you know, the energy of people who you could just feel were appreciative of the opportunity to be, be together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, frankly, that's, that's how it always should be. And that's been the, the power of music to bring people together in that way. So, you know, I yeah. think there's, I think that that kind of healing is, is coming and hopefully we'll see more and more of it. People need it really bad. I mean, but yeah, yeah. you're right. It's right around the corner. So I'm pretty yeah. excited about that. Right on. Um, well, cool. Well, I, I got to get to a quick lightning round before I let you go. Okay. Um, so uh, tell me uh, your favorite city to travel to. Oh man, that's a really tough one, but just, I'm going to say Rome right now. This last time I was in Rome, I just fell in love with that city. So oh, that's great. 
I love it there. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a it's a it's a walking museum, right? Just yeah. everywhere you look is every corner. And, and, yeah, yeah, just incredible. Yeah, totally. Um, who's your favorite DJ? Ooh, well, uh, Rich Medina comes to mind. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, he's one of many favorites, but I was thinking about him when we were talking about DJs and um, eclectic mixing and stuff. So I'll, Rich Medina's up there. That's great. What's the last great book you read or listened to? Man, it has been a while since I have even read a book, which is weird because um, usually I would read 20 to 30 a year. Um, yeah. I would say maybe The Geography of Nowhere by James Howard Kunstler. It's a sort of a, okay. it's a civil engineering book, but it's funny. And it's mm. kind of about how American society is laid out geographically. Yeah, his stuff is really great. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Um, what movie do you think you've seen the most in your life? Uh, uh probably two italian movies once again uh probably la dolce vita and the grand beauty uh, the great beauty the great beauty. okay cool nice yeah. um, and bo both set in rome so there you go is that right okay <laughs> yeah. With, something about rome a theme. yeah absolutely um who's somebody you've learned a lot from that you haven't met oh man uh well Let's see, I was about to say somebody, but I've met him. I don't know him. Um, learned that from I haven't met. Um, I've had the good fortune of meeting the two people who have inspired me the most. Uh, so, but I don't know them well. So who, who Paul, that? Paul Weller and Ian Mackay. So Paul Weller, um, more for the, the, the longevity of his career and the style council years, because that was a very mm -hmm. eclectic, I, I said to somebody before um, not too long ago that that kind of inspired thievery a little bit because it at least opened our eye, our minds to the fact that you can have a project and be very eclectic. Mm. Um, that was a very eclectic project, the Style Council. And then Ian yeah. Mackay because of this, the DC Punk thing and the DIY, do it yourself, never sign to a label, create your own label, um, mm -hmm. Discord Records, which was his is his record label. Um, mm -hmm. just that incredible um, impact on me and Rob. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's amazing now the explosion of, you know, independent music in which obviously, you know, you guys and people in, in our world have been doing for, for decades. Uh, but, you know, the whole the whole world is waking up to to those ideas. Yeah. Um, and starting to think outside of the label system in ways that you know were were either not possible or weren't uh, didn't seem comfortable to people up until yeah. recently. It's exciting. I think you know as much as it's I don't know it's it's maybe hard in some ways to get excited about music now. Uh, possibly I find it hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, me too. Yeah, but. Um, but we're also not 16 when you're supposed yeah. to be like the most excited about music. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, um, the possibilities are, you know, uh, exponentially getting more and more interesting. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Um, is there anything that, that, uh, you you've discovered recently that's been really exciting musically yeah um, yeah yeah or maybe in general in art and whatever but yeah i was thinking musically uh you no know, actually i mean other than individual songs which you know i can't even uh name yeah. for you there's there's no particular music project that's really caught my ear in the last couple years yeah. um I mean, I do like those guys that, that uh, I don't know, never even know how to pronounce their name, like Krugenbaum or, you know, uh -huh. the, the trio from Houston that basically yeah. they're playing like Thai psych rock, you know, but with their own, you know, twist on it. I mean, they're hugely sure. popular, you know, for, you know, a trio and I think they're really mm -hmm. good, but 
Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of like caught in my own record collection at the moment. I think that's totally fair. Yeah, uh, I, I have yeah. a feeling you might be the same way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I kind of swing back and forth. Like I, I like discovering new music, mm -hmm. always have. Um, and there's a part of me that feels like I should to kind of stay on top of things. But I also realize, you know, you're never going to stay on top of it now. There's just way too much of it. And I'm also yeah. not going to waste my life listening to a bunch of garbage that I have no interest in. Right. right. Um, or that, you know, is not for me, whatever. Um, well, you probably, so, I mean, I guess on Spotify and stuff, these, these playlists serve as like today's version of the compilation, but man, yeah. I, as somebody who made a lot of compilations in the past on, you know, our label, I mean, I just, I just loved compilations, you know, cause they turned yeah. on to so much new music totally. and, and yeah, we're really missing that. I think, uh, I don't think that the playlists are really cutting it, you know, because anyone can make a playlist. Right. So. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, I mean, I still listen to DJ mixes, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's on Mixcloud or SoundCloud or, you know, whatever right if they're djs that i like and respect i still want to hear what they're putting together um i think uh yeah i for me i'm less interested in the algorithmic playlists that you know um are designed to keep you listening right so it's it's got to kind of be good enough and and yeah. and similar enough to whatever and i think you know it's cool on the one hand that that stuff exists mm -hmm. i also think it's not really for me and, yeah, and yeah, I'd rather dig in my my own crates mm -hmm. and find something that I love. It's funny, I you know I woke up this morning hearing the fix in my head. Uh, <laughs> one one thing leads to another, yeah, and, yeah, and right. like, and I put that song on, and I was like, this makes me so happy. Yeah, like, I just I love this record. It's a good song. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is yeah. right, and you know, and and I had a moment where I was like reflecting on myself of like just how happy hearing that song in that moment made me. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is the point of all of this, right? It's not just to have something on in the background. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway. That, that's cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, last question. If I worked for you, what's something I would hear you say over and over? Oh, man. Um, well, what would you hear me say? I don't know. I don't have like a lot of catchphrases, but I've been known to change my mind, like, <laughs> like a just frustrating amount of times for people who work for me. So I, right? I will say one thing one day very emphatically, and the next day I'll say, you know, I've been thinking about it and I'm going to need a little bit more time. And yeah, sure. I, I'm a, a little all over the place. So, um, so maybe okay. uh, I've changed my mind is something you <laughs> heard me say. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. I think that's, you know, hopefully your people can, can get that about you and anticipate that that yeah, might be coming. Yeah, they've gotten used to it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's good. Um, that's good training for, I think, the rest of life where, you know, life throws curveball at us. Yeah. That we weren't yeah, expecting. Sure. Yeah. Well, man, thanks so much for spending time with me. It was really fun Absolutely, talking to you. Absolutely, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, excited to hear the rest of what's coming. Cool. Um, and it, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of great stuff headed our way. So we'll definitely be following that. Awesome. All right. Well, um, talk again soon. Well, that was Eric Hilton on Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Make sure you check out Ceremony on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, wherever you stream music. Um, and make sure you keep watching for all of Eric's music that uh, seems like we're going to get blessed with quite a bit coming up. Let us know what you thought. Hit us on Twitter or Facebook. It's at Rebel Radio Net. You can find videos of a lot of our interviews on our YouTube channel. And most importantly, come back next week for more Rebel Radio. Peace. <laughs>